So today we're in John chapter 10 and verse 7 to 21. And the title is The Good Shepherd. This is part three of our journey through this chapter. How a shepherd protects and feeds and loves the sheep. And I'm excited to share on this today. Um, As we continue in John chapter 10, someone pointed out to me that uh, last week that the shepherd in the title image on the screen uh, looks a little bit like an assassin. Uh, So (laughs) I just want to clear that up. Uh, That is a picture of a very kind, caring, gentle shepherd, uh, not a ninja or a hitman assassin. But we are talking about Jesus being the good shepherd and... uh, I guess it's true, you don't want to mess with Jesus or with his lambs, because he'll be worse than an assassin. (laughs) He can take those uh, enemies out to protect the sheep, right? So however you want to see that picture. (laughs) Uh, But let's read the passage, John 10, and we'll start in verse 1 down to verse 8 right now. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him and they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever come before me, came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. We spent the last two Sundays studying verse one to six, how Jesus is our good shepherd. And verse six says the Pharisees and the others in the crowd listening to Jesus did not understand the meaning of his illustration. So here in verse seven, Jesus now takes time to explain the whole metaphor again, adding more description and color to his teaching. So before we dive in there, just a quick review. So far we have looked at the following things, how the Bible likens us to sheep who need a shepherd, how God is like a shepherd who loves the sheep, how the Bible describes spiritual leaders as shepherds and how Jesus is contrasting himself here with the Pharisees in John chapter 10, Jesus the shepherd and the Pharisees the false shepherds. And so as we look closely at this chapter, we see Jesus describing five different ways that he cares for us like the true shepherd. He talks about how a shepherd enters the sheepfold, how they lead the sheep. We've gone over those. And we'll talk more today about how he protects and feeds and loves. And so a shepherd comes in legitimately. He cares for the well-being of the sheep. The Pharisees came in almost hopping over the wall illegitimately because they were seeking their own personal gain. We also talked how a true shepherd leads his sheep, how he doesn't drive the sheep or or beat the sheep. He doesn't motivate them through uh, guilt and frustration and, and anger, but a true shepherd leads them and they willingly follow because he calls them by name and they learn to trust his voice and and that he is a safe and stable provider for them. And Jesus really is the true shepherd who came first to the sheepfold of Israel and he called people individually to follow him and many did. We've seen the disciples, we've seen Nicodemus, we've seen the woman at the well, the guy who was paralyzed and now this guy who was blind who are hearing the voice of the shepherd and coming out of that sheepfold of Israel to follow Jesus. And the Pharisees kicked this guy out of the synagogue who who was formerly blind and he trusted in Christ. But Jesus came and he called this man and led him out of dead religion and of dead works and human effort. And he led him out of all that to the green pastures of salvation into Jesus' flock of true believers. And today we'll start our study in verse seven, and we'll see that Jesus is the true shepherd who also protects and feeds and loves genuinely the flock. So look again at verse seven. Then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Now, first we've got to notice this is another I am statement of Jesus. 
We've put the list up a few times already through our study in John, but you can see that Jesus is saying, I am, which is invoking the name of God from Exodus chapter 3, the burning bush. In the Greek, I am, ego, a me, it's a clear and exclusive claim that Jesus is God in the flesh. And not just that he is God in the flesh, but also describing now more about who God is. In the Old Testament, I am that I am. Now Jesus fills it in. I am the door of the sheep is one of those statements. So what does Jesus mean when he says, I am the door? And this needs some definition. We've talked already about the idea of a sheepfold. A sheepfold is a pen that, that holds the sheep. And it has an open doorway. It didn't actually have a swinging door, which would be, you know, interesting. How on earth do you keep the sheep in the pen? Well, the shepherd literally was the door. You can see in one of the little pictures down there. And they would guard the sheep when they were in the fold. They would even sleep in the doorway at night. The walls are too high for the jackals and the wolves to get in. So if any predator wants to come in, they have to come through the shepherd. And I wonder if, if this is where that saying comes that we sometimes hear, over my dead body. <laughs> you ever heard that one before? It's like Jesus is saying, I'm the door and no wolf is coming near my sheep without crossing me. So the first thing this illustration teaches is how a shepherd brings safety and protection. How a shepherd guards the door, guards the flock. And so we can see an application right away here about our good shepherd. Jesus is our protector. He's our shield. He's our guard. He's our defense. He's like a bouncer or a bodyguard for the sheep. He is literally the guard over the gateway, so you can understand that you are safe when you're in Jesus' sheepfold, when you've trusted in him. You see, Jesus is 1,000 plus times stronger than any evil spirit, any scheme that is dispatched against you, Jesus always protects. Look at 2 Thessalonians 3. It says, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Jesus protects us from much more than we think about and realize every day. And when we're walking close to him, nothing can touch us without Jesus' permission. Let that settle into your heart for a minute. He is always your door. He's always guarding you. And nothing can touch you without his permission, especially when we're close to the shepherd. Now, if we stray and we try and get out and stuff, well, we can cause damage in our life. But Jesus is still our good shepherd, and he's always there as soon as we call to him. Look at Psalm 18. It says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold. That's a lot of words to say he's the door, he's the guard, he's the protector, he's my safety. And let this be encouraging to you. If you've trusted in Christ, you're in the sheepfold. And actually, the, the door there, the shepherd, he not only stops the wolves coming in, but he also keeps those sheep from getting too far out. Even if they try, he can, he can stop them. He can keep us where we need to be. He can keep us safe. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't stray. We do go off course sometimes in our life, and a lot of the trouble in our life is caused by our own actions. But the Lord is still guarding over us wherever we go. And a great question does come to us from time to time. God, why did this trouble come into my life even when I wasn't straying? Anyone ever thought of, thought of that question? <laughs> Lord, I, I, was, I was seeking you. I was doing your will. I didn't do, I've done a lot worse and, and you've forgiven me and healed me and I'm going on the right path. And then tragedy struck in my life. Maybe an illness. Maybe being laid off from work out of the blue, maybe someone persecuting you or mistreating you, maybe some crazy unforeseen event happens, even a tragedy like we were just talking about and praying for, people who've suffered tragedy. Believers. And in those times, guys, we do not have explanations. Very rarely do we have some kind of explanation from the Lord, but we do have promises and we do have a reassurance of who our Lord is, 
that he is always the door. He's our shield. He's the one who guards over our souls. And we don't have all the whys, but we do know the who. And he is watching over us. We're in the sheepfold, the sheep pen, and he's the door. Nothing can touch us without first crossing him. And when he allows something into our life, it's because, well, we can remember a few things. We may not know exactly why, but we know some things. First of all, he is still the door, and he's allowed this, obviously, for some reason that he knows. Secondly, he's probably holding back a lot more trouble and evil than we even realize. And thirdly, he's allowed it in my life, so he must actually have a good purpose in mind in the end. And the Bible tells us it will work together for my eternal good and for his glory. Romans 8, 28, and many other promises. And here's this picture, you guys. He's the door. Nothing can touch me unless he allows it, and it's part of his sovereign eternal plan. And he's good. He's the good shepherd. So we have that confidence and that trust. Not always the reasons why, but we know who is guarding us. And we know he's so much stronger than all the evil. We know he's protecting us. And Lord, and we can pray like this, Lord, help me to trust you no matter what. Lord, help me to hear what you want to teach me through this trial. Help me to see you more clearly than ever before. Deepen my faith, deepen my walk. And Lord, please deliver me. When you've accomplished what you want to in my life through this trial, deliver me from it. Here's an example of that kind of prayer to our good shepherd who guards us. Psalm 31, in you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me not be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. It's a good prayer. Lord, save me. And believing who he is. Now look again at verse 8. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't hear them. Jesus says they are thieves and robbers. So he's talking about the religious leaders of his day. He's contrasting himself. I'm the good shepherd. These guys, these Pharisees, are the thieves and robbers. And he says the true sheep will not listen to or follow the false shepherd. Jesus makes that clear. God will give his sheep the spiritual discernment that we need to say, uh, no, 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 this is a lie. No, no, this is a false religion. No, no, this is a cult, actually. I need to get out of this, and I need to go back to Jesus because he's our true shepherd. God will work that out. That's what verse 8 is saying. There are those who are seeking, and they will find the truth. God will make sure. So Jesus is the good shepherd who takes the role of being the door, protecting us from danger. Now, that image of the door has more layers to it than just protector. Look again at verse 9. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture or food. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So here we see Jesus as the door is also not just our protector, but also our provider. He's the one who's going to provide salvation and also provide sustenance or food in our lives. And if you want to come in and go out, you have to go through the door. And Jesus is saying, I am that door. If you want to come in, first of all, to salvation, you must come through Jesus. That's what he says there. And also, if you want to feed on good pasture to grow your soul, to grow your salvation in the Lord and know him more, then you have to go through Jesus and you'll find that he provides eternal life and an abundant life to know the Father and to walk with God and have a relationship with God, it only comes through Jesus Christ. And he's clearly saying he's the provider. Now, on the other hand, the false shepherds, they're not going to provide. They're going to rob you of the gospel. They're going to uh, rob you of eternal life. They're going to steal and to kill and to destroy, just like their father, the devil. And they will not provide food for the sheep. And the Pharisees of Jesus' day, that's who he's talking about. They, these false shepherds, they didn't come to provide for the flock. They came to pillage the flock, to fleece the flock. And Jesus says, no, I've come that you may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. 
So imagine how freeing it was when Jesus said that for that guy who was formerly blind and he's just been excommunicated from the synagogue. And then Jesus says, actually, I'm the door. And all you have to do is come to me and you'll have eternal life. You'll be saved and I'll give you life abundant. And so the guy's looking and he's thinking, really? So the Pharisees don't actually hold any power over my life. They don't hold the key to my salvation. Jesus says, no, I'm the door, not them. Wow. You see, it's all about Jesus. It's not about any human who controls us when it comes to salvation and comes to our relationship with God. Now we can be blessed and encouraged by each other, or we can be pulled down by each other, but really it's all about Jesus. Let's keep the focus on him. And really when it comes to salvation, it's all in Jesus Christ himself. And he's claiming here that he's the exclusive way. John 14, verse six, he'll talk about it some more. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. And many people today are offended by this claim of Jesus, but he taught that he exclusively provides salvation. Oh, people might say, well, that's your truth. I have my truth. Well, they might say, look, I want to come through a different door. But Jesus said, no, there is no other door to a relationship with God. It's only through Jesus. He alone is the door. There is no other. Now, don't see this as a negative. Sometimes we think, oh, we've got to get on the defensive here. And, and this kind of sounds like a little bit of an awkward truth that we have to kind of hold to because it's in the Bible. No, no, this is a great truth because We've sinned, we've fallen short of God's glory, we've rebelled against God, we've stuck it in God's face and said, no thanks. And we all deserve his judgment and his wrath and eternal separation from God. But God so loved the world that he gave away. He gave us away. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. There is a way. There's only one, but there is one. There is one. There is a way to be saved. How awesome that is, that God so loved us that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And so all we need to do is repent of our sin and put our faith in Christ. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto, self, unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's a full decision to say, I'm going to confess him as my Savior. He died for my sins and he rose again. And that's it. That's the way of salvation. What a gift. There is a door into the true sheepfold of a relationship with God, and the door is Jesus Christ. Then Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. So it's not just that we receive salvation. We actually receive this thing called the abundant life. Now, what is abundant life? Well, the word abundantly in the ancient account is, is actually an, an accounting word in the ancient language, that means a surplus. It means over and above. It means more than necessary. And it's a beautiful word. Philippians 4.19 kind of describes it. It says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, let's be clear. It does not mean material wealth or health or necessarily a long life. Now, God can bless us in those ways if he wants to. But that's not what Jesus is describing here. Abundant life means Jesus will supernaturally supply all that we need and more to have true fulfillment and true satisfaction, as well as our basic needs fully met abundantly in him. That's what he's talking about. Psalm 23 puts it like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want or I shall not lack because he's my shepherd. He's the good shepherd who provides. And I, I, I have need of nothing because Jesus more than satisfies. This is also called in the New Testament, the spirit-filled life or the overflowing abundant life, abiding in Christ and seeing the fruit of the spirit growing up and overflowing within us, love, joy, peace, patience, being content, being satisfied, overflowing with that abundance of satisfaction and fulfillment in Jesus. And this is the kind of life that Jesus wants all of us, his sheep, to have and to know. Not just a constant grind of barely making it through the day, but actually an overflow of the work of his transforming power and presence in our life. 
And even when life is incredibly hard and we have one of those days or one of those weeks or months or, or years, <laughs> and it's like, this is just hard. Even then, the Lord wants to fill us with a joy and a peace that we're close to our shepherd, that I will not lack, that I, he, he's given me all I need and I have this sense of his presence and that's where my satisfaction and fulfillment lies. Not in the circumstances of my life, but in the shepherd of my life, who's with me at all times. This is the quality of life that can be found only in Jesus Christ, nowhere else. Nowhere else can you have true satisfaction and fulfillment, no matter what's going on, but in Jesus. And Jesus doesn't just say, I've come to give you eternal life. Jesus is saying, I am your abundant life. I've come to give you that quality of life in me, not just from me, but, but in him. As we learn to say, it's, it's not about me, it's more of him. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory, the exchange life of saying less of me and more of you, Lord. That's the abundant life. Do you walk in that, that abundant life? Remember, he's the door. He gives us that peace and protection, but he also gives us the fulfillment, the satisfaction, and he, he pr protects and he provides. Do you have that kind of walk with your shepherd? And, and we have to be active in this. We have to initiate a little bit every day and say, Lord, I'm coming to you because he's already there waiting for us. And he wants to spend time with us. He wants to fill us and give us that strength in his presence. And if we're not coming to the Lord, then we're looking to other things in this world to be our security, to be our provision. And they will never satisfy. They'll never protect. So come to your shepherd. Let's go on and read verse 11 to 15. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep, and I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So Jesus makes it really clear, doesn't he? And this is another I am statement, isn't it? I am the good shepherd. Good means good to the core, or excellent in nature and character. He's the good shepherd. It also means genuine. It's like when something is good, you know it's genuine, it's the real thing. People think about that with coffee. Is this good, is this the genuine coffee or is this, oh man, this has been sitting on a shelf for four years and it's stale and oh, okay, that's not good, it's not the genuine thing. Jesus says, I'm the good, I'm the genuine shepherd. I'm not counterfeit, I'm not stale, I'm not old, I'm the real thing, I'm genuine. And now Jesus describes for us in this passage how he loves the sheep. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus is so good that he's willing to come and die to save us. And Jesus knew the plan. He's even talking here before the cross about the cross, saying, I've come to love you so much I'm going to go to the cross. And Jesus came ready to completely give his life for you and for me. And Jesus looks at you and he looks at me as his precious purchased possession. Do you know that? He's not just a, a, a hireling putting in a few hours to get a paycheck. Jesus considers you and me so valuable. He will do more than even a good human shepherd would do. He will lay down his life for you and for me. And Jesus is contrasting himself in this passage to the Pharisees again. They're like the hired hand who's not the shepherd. They don't own the sheep, so they don't care for the sheep. And when a wolf comes, they will flee, and the wolf will catch the sheep and, the sheep <laughs> and scatter them. So why do false shepherds fail the sheep? It's because they don't care about them. So they really don't care about them. But Jesus does so much that he would die for us. That's how much he loves us, and that's how much he's going to care for us. Hey, if he died for us when we were his enemy, 
How much more is he going to provide for us now that we're following him? How much more is he going to love us and guide us? And you know, if someone was in trouble and the only way to save them was for you to jump in the way of a train or, or a bullet or to take some, uh, to give them a vital organ so that, that they will live, but you're going to die in the process. How many people would we do that for? How many people would we give our life for? Maybe a few people, maybe our kids, maybe our spouse, maybe our family or best friend. And we're made in God's image, so we are capable of that. At least if he helps us in that moment, we're capable of that. But how many of you would give your life to save your worst enemy? And think about who's the mo person who's caused you the most hurt. Would you take a bullet for them? Would you jump in front of a train to save them? Would you give your vital organ to save them? Probably not. <laughs> Let's be, be honest. But that's how much Jesus loves us. Romans 5 puts it like this. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's how much Jesus loves you and me. He's the good shepherd who loves the sheep so much he died for us even when we were against him. Even in our rebellion, he still loves us and he still died to save us and he still forgives our sin. So we, there you go. We've kind of gone through that outline. That's how Jesus describes a shepherd. He's going to um, enter the sheepfold. He's going to lead the right way, he's going to protect, he's going to feed, and he's going to love. And so we've asked those two questions at the outset. What kind of leader was Jesus, and how do we discern true spiritual leaders today? And there's the concept of what a shepherd is. They enter the right way to help the sheep. They lead. They don't drive. They lead. They protect, they feed, and they love. And Jesus says this is all true it's the ultimate way in me. Jesus came in through the front door. Jesus came from the call of God to help us and serve us and love us. And he doesn't drive us. He leads us. He protects us. He feeds us. He provides for us eternal life, even abundant life. And he loves us so much he laid down his life for us. And so this is how we can also discern a good under shepherd today. If you take that grid of what Jesus just taught about who he is. And you think, well, how do I discern a good under shepherd today? Well, turn to Acts chapter 20 and apply those same principles to what Paul said to the leaders of the church at Ephesus. Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 27. And there's so many passages that I could go to right now, but I'll just pick one. And that's Acts 20, verse 27. He says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And here's mm -hmm. Paul. He's gathering the pastors and the elders of this church in Ephesus, and he tells them, I've got to leave now, but when I was with you, and he stayed for some time in Ephesus in the book of Acts, he said, I taught you through the whole Bible. I, I gave you the, uh, the food. I gave you what's abundant, what's true. And this is key for pastors who teach and, and other people who, who lead Bible studies. It's stick to the word of God. This is the food. This is the abundant life. And Paul says, I didn't even hold back any of it. I taught you the whole thing. And you know, there is a place for a topical sermon or a thematical sermon, and as long as they're biblical. But we're convinced here at Calvary Chapel that the best diet for the flock is to go through the whole Bible, to simply explain it and apply it in the context, in its flow, and let the Word of God feed us. Not my pet topic or <laughs> some, some pastors, they're, they're honestly, they're writing some book on the side and they're going to preach their, their chapters in their services and, and they've got one thing in mind and, and they pick a verse here, pick a verse there. And sometimes God uses that and works through that for sure. But the real diet, the, what we really need is to be fed the word of God itself and to be taught the Bible. There's a difference between teaching from the Bible and teaching the Bible. And that's our goal. And I know that there are many other church groups, not just Calvary Chapel, that do expositional verse by verse teaching. And I'm really thankful for them. But it is probably the most obvious hallmark of Calvary Chapel and the movement of Calvary Chapels that we we see that we should be committed, like Paul, to, to giving the whole counsel of God.
But keep going in this chapter. Verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So a real shepherd is going to warn the sheep. He's going to guard the sheep. He's going to protect the sheep. And if you want to judge a good um, and you want to discern if someone's a, a true spiritual leader, is what they're teaching, is it feeding you the truth and is it warning you against the lies and the deceptions? Because Satan's got lots of lies and deceptions out there, deceiving and destroying lives. He's the thief who's come to steal, kill, and destroy. And as an under-shepherd, it's our duty to warn and guard and protect the flock. So please pray for me, but also pray for other pastors in our city and in our province and in our country. Pray that we would have this kind of heart to love the sheep, to feed the sheep, to protect the sheep. And pray that God will raise up more shepherds like that. Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 is a good prayer. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And that's our prayer that the Lord will continue to raise up those who will follow him in that way. Now, we're not quite done. Go back to John chapter 10. There's a few more verses to finish this little section. John chapter 10, and uh, I know we're, this is like the third week going through this passage about uh, sheep and shepherds, and uh, it's, it's a lot about that. There's even more coming, and, and I could make some uh, jokes about sheep and all of that, but you know they would be really, really bad. So I won't try. I won't uh, pretend I'm funny. I won't try and pull the wool over anyone's eyes at all. I'm not going to try and ram those things home, but let's look at verse 16. <laughs> yeah. And the other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them I must bring. Them I also must bring. And they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Now, verse 16 is a super interesting verse. It's a lot in there, and I'll try and condense it into a couple things. What is Jesus talking about? He says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Them I must also bring. Well, the fold, first of all, is the house of Israel. Jesus has come to the house of Israel, and he's taking those people like the blind guy who got healed out of dead religion to himself, to his true flock. But then he says, I, I have another fold that I'm going to go to. <laughs> so what is that? Well, it's actually really simple. Jesus came first to the Jews, but you see as you read the book of Acts, he also came for the Gentiles. And in Acts chapter 10, the gospel goes out to the rest of the world. And so this is prophesying, Jesus is prophesying about you and me. The 99% of us are not Jewish by ancestry. That means we're Gentiles. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to also bring people out of the dead sheepfold of the world and the dead sheepfold of false religion. That, not just Israel, but the Gentiles as well. And so we are in the age of the church where both Jews and Gentiles find salvation in Christ Jesus. The, the wall of separation is knocked down. Ephesians 2, Jesus is our true shepherd. And Jesus calls us to follow him. And he says there, they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So Jesus is referring to another ancient prophecy here about himself. And the term one shepherd actually comes from Ezekiel 34. And it's a whole chapter where God rebukes the worthless shepherds of Israel. And in Ezekiel 34, 23, he says, I will establish one shepherd over them and he shall feed them. My, my servant David, and he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And this is after King David. So it's the ultimate in the line of David. It's talking about Jesus, one shepherd over them. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, and there will be one shepherd. Do you see that? 
in verse 16. He's fulfilling Ezekiel himself. And he's going to bring us in, and, and he has done, and we are the fulfillment of verse 16. Jesus also said, interesting in that verse, there will be one flock. And this is where we get the idea that the church is one huge giant flock of sheep. Now the King James Bible actually says one fold instead of one flock. And that is actually not the right word. There was a mistranslation in the original King James. Yes, there was. <laughs> and you can go through the history. It comes back to a guy who wrote the Latin Vulgate. His name was Jerome. And he put in the word, there will be one fold. But actually the true word, if John wrote this in the Greek. The word is poimne and it's, it's translated one flock. You say, well, what's the difference? One fold, one flock. It's actually a big difference. And I'm glad that the New King James and other more modern translations with more resources, more manuscripts have corrected that. It's, it's one flock. And here's the, the reason it's a difference. Because if it was one fold, then churches could easily say, hey, there's only one true church. And our church is the true church. And you have to join our church because there's only one fold. Jesus said it. No, he didn't. He said there's one flock. Different meaning. And so we do not believe that we are the perfect church or the only church by which you can have a relationship with God. Salvation is not found in one denomination of a church. There is no perfect church. There are many sheepfolds, but one flock. Get that? Many folds, one flock, one shepherd. And so we believe there are many churches out there. They may have a different name up on the door. They may have some different traditions. They may have some variations in how we see non-essential things and how we emphasize different things. But if they believe the gospel and they present genuinely Jesus Christ as the Savior and the gospel and the word of God, then we are really just the same flock. And we have to get that straight. The church is not one organization or one building. The church is actually you and me and all true followers of Jesus Christ. Many folds, but one flock under one shepherd. Now we do have some differences with other sheepfolds, even with other churches in our city and in our nation. But, hey, if the gospel is being preached and the word of God is being believed and followed, then we're on the same team. Let's make that abundantly clear. We must treat them as teammates, as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, because Jesus is the one shepherd and our unity is found in him and loving him. So Jesus says, they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So John 10, verse 17, keep going. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to take it, to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. So here Jesus is talking about how he will willingly go to the cross. He was not forced. He was not dragged to the cross. He knew his mission from the Father, and he came to do the Father's will, to lay down his life. And he says he will take it up again. So throughout scripture, we see that Jesus was not a victim on the cross. Jesus was a willing sacrifice. He could have easily called a thousand angels and just come down. He could have, he could have let go of the nails that he was holding together, according to Colossians 1. He's holding everything together. He could have just let go of them and they would have vaporized. But he went to the cross for you and for me by choice. And he rose again by his own power, it says there. So look at verse um, 19 now, the people's response. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? <laughs> they keep coming up with these crazy accusations. Verse 21, others said, these are not the words uh, of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And so there you see the context. This is all back to John chapter 9. The blind guy is healed. He's standing right there. Jesus is saying, you don't need to follow the Pharisees. They're not the door. They're not the true shepherd. I am. I'm the one who's going to care for you and provide for you, and protect you, and give you eternal life and life abundant. So you see here a divided response. Did you see that there in verse 
19, there was division again among these Jews because of these sayings. Some of them accuse him. Oh, he's speaking from a demon. Others say, no, no, no. How could he heal a blind guy? He must be from God. And so the people were divided. And we shouldn't be surprised that people will continue to have mixed responses. And our job is not to convince people, but it is to plant seeds. It is to spread the word and let the Holy Spirit work in their lives. But here's the big question today. What is your response? Have you made that decision to believe in Jesus Christ as God in the flesh, the Son who's come to save us and to give us the abundant life. Maybe you're here and you do not yet know the Lord. Jesus said it. He came to lay down his life for you. And he did so. He, he gave his life in place of you. And you can receive forgiveness as you put your trust in Jesus Christ. In a moment, we'll pray. And when we pray, you can call out on the name of the Lord and believe in him and be saved. Yes, you can. And as we close, I want to share, brothers and sisters, an encouragement for you out of this passage today. Whatever you're facing, whatever's going on, you may not know the why of the situation, but you do know who is guarding you. You do know who is providing for you. You do know who loves you more than anyone else, and that is Jesus Christ, your good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd who loves us, leads us, feeds us, protects us, and we have all that we need in him. And this is so comforting. But understand, to walk in this abundant life, to walk with our shepherd, it takes the effort on our part to put him first, to say, yes, I've decided today I'm going to put Jesus first in my life. I'm going to seek him and I'm going to ask for his help and I'm going to do everything by prayer not in my might, not in my power, but Lord, help me by your spirit. Guide me, lead me close. You see God's protection, his safety, and the abundant life, they work by proximity to the shepherd. They don't work when we're straying. We miss out. What we need to do is come back and put Jesus first and say, you're my shepherd. I want to stay close to you. I can't do it, but help me. And Lord, help me to make the right choices. Help me to put aside things that distract or cause me to sin, to put off every weight and every sin that slows me down. And Lord, to run to you, to look to you, to live for you. And, and here's the great thing. You do not have to figure everything out. You don't have to work out where the provision comes from. You don't have to work out where the safety comes from. The shepherd takes care of all that. Our part is to stay close to him and trust him with all the details. Are you close to your shepherd? Are you walking close with him in this season of life, this summer? Don't take a vacation from Jesus. Draw closer to him than ever before and say, Lord, I want to be near to you. And when the thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy, call out to Jesus and say, no, Lord, help me to say no. He provides a way of escape. He gets us out of that. And he gives us again that abundant life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you have come to give us true abundant life. And so, Lord, we realize that we do stray, we do wander away, and we do get the wrong attitude. But, Lord, you're always there. You're our door to the sheepfold. You're the one who always knows what's going on. You provide, you take us out into pasture, you bring us into the safety, Lord, and the protection of a relationship with you. And you love us so much, you paid the price and you purchased us with your own blood. And Lord, no human ever did that, but you did. And you're the true shepherd. And Lord, we come before you today and say, Lord, help us to commit our struggles to you, to commit our questions to you to commit our unknowns and the uncertainties of life into your hands and to find that contentment and that abundant life in your presence. Lord, give us your peace and your strength. And thank you that you never fail us. You're so faithful. And we love you. In Jesus' name. And if you are here today and you 
have not received him as your savior, you can call out right now, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I want to come back. I want to ask you to forgive me of all my sin. And today I ask you to forgive me. I thank you that you went to the cross, that you rose again for me. And I ask you to save me, come into my life and be my shepherd. And I ask this and I receive this in Jesus' name. Amen.